Hi, I'm Carol Higgins coming to you live from the Baptist Health Newsroom. Diabetes is our topic today. It's a disease that affects an estimated 30 million people here in the United States and the Centers for Disease Control, the CDC, estimates that an additional 84 million people have what they call prediabetes. And that's when your blood sugar is higher than it should be, but not high enough to qualify as diabetes. So we're talking about a lot of people here, and we're talking about Diabetes Awareness Month in November. So it's the perfect time to talk about living uh, lifestyle changes that we can make to help control our blood sugar. And I have two wonderful experts here with us today. First, I'd like to introduce Amy Kimberlane. She's a registered dietitian at Baptist Health South Florida. And Lois Exelbert, who is manager of the Diabetes Care Center at Baptist Hospital. Thank you both for being here. Yes. Very welcome. Thank you for having us. For sure. Before we jump into our subject too deeply, though, I'd like to remind our audience to please send in your questions and comments throughout the segment. At the end, we'll have a Q&A session where our experts will answer as many as we have time for today. So please make this interactive and tell us what you want to know. All right, let's start by laying some groundwork for our discussion today. I think most people have probably heard that there's more than one type of diabetes. Lois, can you walk us through what they are and the differences between them? Yes, primarily the two that we're most familiar with is literally type one and type two. We got rid of the old names that used to qualify it based on age. So oh. we don't say juvenile diabetes, we don't say maturity onset, it's either type one or type two. But there's also gestational diabetes, which affects women who are pregnant. And then there are other some you know, very, very clinical types of diabetes um, that we won't go into today anyway, but those are primarily the types. Type one is an autoimmune disease. So Ooh. the body literally attacks those insulin producing cells oh, goodness. so that insulin does not get produced. Whereas type two is either an inefficient or inadequate amount of insulin, either or, which actually is not that easy to understand oftentimes. Yeah, it, there is a lot of confusion with it, I think. Um, and I understand that according to the CDC, nine out of 10 people don't know that they're at risk. What, what's that all about? Yeah, that's very sad, <laughs> as a matter of fact. It, it boils down to the fact that we don't test properly for it. Um, we're accustomed to doing fasting blood sugars all the time with fasting labs. And oftentimes people with either prediabetes or early type two have normal fasting levels, but after meals, their levels are higher and we would never pick that up. Oh my goodness. Um, I just wanna add yes, in, I please. think we're, you know, again, you're discussing and not talking about knowing the numbers or understanding the numbers. I think sometimes people go into the doctor's office and they may go in for a different visit and the numbers aren't addressed. So I always encourage to be your own advocate when you mm -hmm. do go into the doctor appointments. Mm -hmm. And if you've seen something on the lab values or if you have family history, which we'll talk about, you know, again, all of those are kind of important factors to bring and talk to the doctor. And again, as I said, be your own advocate. And if you see something irregular. And Absolutely. diabetes, I think there may be a little misconception out there that, oh, it's just diabetes, you take some medicine, you feel better. But there are some really serious consequences that can happen from this disease. You wanna tell us about them? Absolutely, well, the primary complications, and by the way, all the complications relate to blood sugars that remain out of control. Okay. So chronic high blood sugars create all of these complications, but kid the kidneys are affected which could end up requiring dialysis. The eyes are affected, which literally can lead to blindness. The nerve endings are affected so that feeling is destroyed. And God forbid, if it's in the feet, you could you know, not know that you've injured yourself and amputations are common. And the entire cardiovascular system. So all of those um, areas are prime places for high blood sugar to attack. That sounds very serious. So it is something we should be taking seriously. Um, Amy, let's talk about risk factors. What are some of the risk factors and is there one you'd like to focus on above the others? So I mentioned it just a second ago, looking at if you have it within your family. So genetics plays a big you know, role in looking at, again, not meaning that you're going to get it, but again, at risk. And so again, if you are within a family that has diabetes, it would be a definite indicator for you to have testing take place. And Lois mentioned it, where they may be testing just a fasting level, you would ask for an A1C, and you can explain you know, in depth about it, Lois. But you know, when you're looking at risk factors, it's age, 
um, its gender, its ethnicity. So a lot of different areas that we play into. And again, kind of a myth that, you know, again, it's linked to only people that within weight categories, right? So it, it sets a tone for looking at all different areas and they actually have different tests that you can run through to see just on paper to see if you would be at risk, right? Um, but again, going in for the blood work is so important. And again, it's not just a fasting, it would be the A1C, which is kind of the gold standard when you're looking at testing. What is A1C? And, and an A1C <laughs> is a simple blood test, mm -hmm. but it measures the A1 component of hemoglobin, mm -hmm. which by accident in the laboratory in 1978, mm -hmm was determined to have an affinity to sugar. So since the half-life of the molecule is three months, it was you know, kind of hypothesized that could we measure this A1 component of hemoglobin and also know on average how a person's blood sugar has been. Oh. And the value is in a percent. Okay. And, and so is that less dependent on if you're fasting or not? Absolutely. Okay. It could be done at That's any That's why time. it's more the gold standard, Correct. I understand. Okay. Exactly. What are some of the numbers that people should have in mind? Waking up in the morning before eating anything, normal blood sugar is less than 100. Okay. And then two hours after eating any meal at all, it should be less than 140. Okay. And the A1C should be less than 6.5. 6.5, and so we're talking that's full diabetes, so that's not the pre-diabetes. Are those numbers just slightly lower? Pre-diabetes is slightly lower. So diagnostically, mm -hmm. we diagnose at a blood glucose in the morning at 126, mm -hmm. or a random blood sugar at 200. And the A1C, we diagnosed with pre-diabetes between, I think it's from 5.7 to 6.4. So this, these are a lot of um, important numbers that people have to keep track of. Um, I'm sure that once you've been diagnosed with this condition, you have to um, measure what you're doing. What are the measurement tools that are involved and how often do people with diabetes have to measure their levels? Yeah, well, you know, as Amy knows too, it depends on the type of diabetes, number one. It depends on what medications you're taking is a second consideration and also depends on how controlled you are. So if you're very well controlled and you're in a plan that you know very well about, you may not have to test as often. But if we are now at a point where we're trying to regulate your medication and your blood sugars, people test anywhere from two up to eight, 10 times a day. Really, that yes. often. Mm -hmm. and, and just to add on to that, I always tell, you know, the patient to test with purpose, right? So where Lois is saying if they have obviously within control, there's maybe not as much testing, but they might be trying a new meal out and want to see how the food affects their blood sugar. And so there would be the ability to test to see and then again, check with the two hour level again to see how immediately or how that food affected them, right? Within insulin, as Lois mentioned, people are testing more frequently for that reason because you're dosing medication based on then a blood sugar level to either correct it and or cover for the food that you're about to eat. So it's important to know the level prior to. So I think it, it, yes, depends on the levels, but then also I always make sure people are testing with purpose. You're not just testing to see how high it went just because you ate something, right? That maybe right. you knew was going to do that, right? right. So again, it's it's, it comes along with knowing and understanding. And I always teach patients, it's not about judging a number that's good or bad. Mm -hmm. You're rather looking at numbers to understand them. Mm -hmm. And as she said, make adjustments or, you know, again, maybe it's a medication change that you need because now things are in control, right? Mm -hmm. um, and you don't need as high a dose per se. But all of those come into play with, as I mentioned, you know, again, yes, knowing your numbers and being an advocate when you go into the doctor's office and having that information and understanding it too. So yes, it's a lot to grasp. But I do think that that's where it comes in with education and mm -hmm. understanding mm -hmm. and meeting not only with your doctor, but a nurse practitioner, a nurse educator, um, dietitian as well. All of those play into making sense and understanding with the person being at the center of their management, but again, all team approach. Well, before we even get to a point where we're taking medication, right. um, let's talk about the role food plays because you're talking about testing before this meal, after this meal. Yeah. Experts are always telling us to develop better eating habits, to become more healthy. That must be particularly true with diabetes. What suggestions do you have for people who are trying to avoid diabetes to change their eating habits? It's a great question. And I do believe that it all starts individually and like looking and reflecting to say, what do I need to change? What do I need to improve? So my goal might be different than Lois's, right? And different for whomever's watching today, but it's that self-reflection and looking, we kind of gear it towards a plate. 
Baptist has a plate, and what we do is we look at making half of the plate to be non-starchy vegetables, a quarter of the plate to be lean protein, and a quarter of the plate to be what would be a whole grain. So all of those then create the discussion of, are you eating enough vegetables? And I said non-starchy vegetables, meaning they don't have the carbohydrate within that would affect a blood sugar, but nine out of 10 Americans aren't eating enough vegetables, right? right? So we know it to be problematic. And again, it goes back to the knowing number issue. Is it that they don't eat them because they don't know how to make them? Or is it that they don't eat them because they really, again, just don't and haven't grown up with them or don't mm -hmm. think they taste good? I mean, mm -hmm. there's so many different reasons. But again, that's the encouragement to say, hey, can you try a new vegetable out for the week? Try it three different ways. Maybe then you find the way that you do like so that now you're including it. Um, we currently have a diabetes prevention program, which I'll mention again, but it, it's in that program right now. We have a particular family that you know didn't eat vegetables prior mm -hmm. um, and now they've incorporated it. She's having it at lunch, he's having it at dinner. And again, now their son's in, getting interested in, in it as well. So it's like this domino effect when you're introducing. So it was a family affair of eating more vegetables. The other number one thing I suggest is looking at whole grains, okay. right? So if I'm eating oatmeal in the morning, bread at lunch and rice at dinner, the goal is to make half of the grains whole. Okay. So again, if you've had whole grain oats, whole rolled oats in the morning, and now you had maybe possibly a wheat bread, whole wheat rather at lunch, is it okay to have white rice at dinner? Yes. You know, again, you're looking at the, the multitude of the day and taking sure. it into account to have whole grains to make up half the amount. So that's another area of where I would look for change. And then again, the number other one area that I look at are sugary drinks, right? Um, and again, I think it's the easiest change to kind of switch out and make and look. I don't know that we always take into account our beverages, mm -hmm. but thinking mm -hmm. about what we're drinking, and again, we may encourage water, but the other encouragement is to know how much you're taking in. Sure. A lot of times people just don't even realize if it's, you know, we may think of it as juice as being healthy and natural because it comes from a fruit, but it's the same as soda and it's the same as sweet tea and it's the same as whatever popular coffee is out there for this week, uh -huh. right? <laughs> yeah. we, we we love them, right? And so again, knowing how much you're taking in and the, the, the goal is to limit and start to reduce consumption. Reducing consumption and sticking to this healthy plan that we've tried to make for ourselves. We're in like the worst possible time of year for that. <laughs> yes. I mean, speaking for myself, it's yes. like, oh my God. Um, so at holiday time, it can be more difficult. What kind of tips or suggestions do you ladies have to help us you know, stay as close as we can to our healthy eating plan. Before Amy answers that, because I know <laughs> she's got some good suggestions. What Amy was talking about is a perfect example of the difference between sitting down with a dietitian mm -hmm. or a certified diabetes educator who is also a dietitian and literally reviewing personally what that person does. Right. Instead of a paper that says to you, or or a person who has said to you, avoid all white foods. Gotcha, right. That's you know? a little too general for yes. what you so, really need. So, yeah, we, we need to get away from those kinds of expressions. Now, go ahead. No, I agree, <laughs> and I didn't mention it, Lois, but I think yeah. that that's the unfortunate, you walk into an office and you may not have the ability to have those one-on-one -on -one sessions, mm -hmm. and that might be the information given, and someone walks out going, what can I eat? Right. You know, so again, right. as I mentioned, definitely individual, but then also reflecting to say, what do I need to change? And I do believe it's one change at a time, adding on and continuing the, the, the path, right? It's mm -hmm. not just a quick fix and I'm over it, right? right? It's really building on it to create these healthy habits. And again, it takes time. You may not have eaten vegetables for your whole life, and now you're starting to try them. So definitely, you know, giving yourself the ability to implement change and then come back to, like I mentioned, maybe you're not going to love all vegetables, right. but it's finding the ones that you do and maybe in a different form that you like. As to holidays, I mean, listen, I, I would tell you there's a celebration all the time. I mean, we're in the middle of football season. Now basketball yeah. season started, right. so I joke, but whether or not it's Thanksgiving, Christmas, you know, Hanukkah, all of the different celebratory things, my encouragement for patients is always to try and look at what could be a new kind of idea of something to bring to these parties. Mm. Um, and again, it might be the frequency of the parties is the issue. And so maybe saying even no to a few of them, not to be antisocial, but um, <laughs> the point is, is maybe it's even a, a good thing for you stress-wise too to not mm -hmm. have to go to all the functions mm -hmm. but again what I started to say is forming a new kind of norm right mm -hmm. and you being the person that brings something healthier to the table right. and to the get get together rather and so if it's a salad mm -hmm. of sorts and it's there people eat it right, right. Um, I know again I keep referencing the diabetes prevention program but our participants are learning and putting these things in motion and they mm -hmm. have like pizza Friday days um, and one of our participants the other day brought the salad 
you know, and I don't think that that would have been the norm from before. Probably not. And, and he probably yeah. didn't think he'd be the one bringing it. Right. But sure enough, you know, again, starting new traditions. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's part of when we look at holidays and celebrations, food is celebratory. And so I'm not taking away from what might be grandma's favorite dish that she makes sure. or all of those things, but it's really trying to um, gauge what's in front and then kind of also decide what you'll be putting on your plate as well. So portions play into it. And then again, just the frequency of the functions, right? right. Is there gonna be two parties in one day? I mean, it gets difficult in the planning part of it. It really does. And you don't want to insult your hostess or right. your host um, by not having things, but they have to understand. I mean, awareness, I think, is increasing, probably not as much as you ladies would like to see it, but um, I think it, it is. One area I'd like to talk to you a little bit about is children diagnosed with diabetes and the fact that over the last decades, that number has just soared. What can you tell us about that, Lois? Is it what they're eating or what's happening? Well, it's a really good question and it's a complicated, you know, kind of answer as well, including the fact that we don't know for sure. But type one diabetes used to always occur in children. Mm -hmm. Now it occurs in adults. And type two diabetes that used to always occur just in adults is now occurring in children. So it's a combined effect, mm -hmm. whether it is also hereditary and genetic and ethnic in nature, um, which is in both types of diabetes, by the way. Okay. Um, or, you know, how much is hereditary and how much is environmental? And, you know, if, if the kinds of foods you're growing up with are the kinds of foods that can cause you to be overweight or the fact that you never exercise, then those are two environmental factors that right. clearly you know, right. can increase the percentage of people with diabetes. And, and I know one factor that I've heard you speak about, Amy, before is hidden sugars. And you already talked about the sugary drinks, yeah. but what about all these other places where we might think it might be labeled healthy, but there's sugar hidden. Do you have any examples of that yeah. for us? <laughs> Lois laughs, but I mean, I think it, it's truthful in that when we discuss sugar, so I mentioned it in beverages, and I would tell you that it's added sugars in general. So whether it's, again, honey or maple syrup or agave, all of those are referenced to being kind of maybe in the thought, what you said, healthier, they're still considered added sugar. And mm. so when we think of added sugar, it goes back to knowing how much that you're getting and then those hidden places as you alluded to. So whether it's yogurt, whether it's ketchup, whether it's bread, whether it's cereal that people's eating, you know, all of those are different locations of where sugar can be added versus kind of obvious ones like desserts, cakes, cookies, pies, candy, right? right? That's added sugar. So how much added sugar should someone consume in a day? For females, it's six teaspoons, which equates to roughly 24 grams. So whether you're measuring it with a teaspoon or you're looking at a label. And then for men, it's nine teaspoons or roughly 36 grams. So again, that's added versus natural. So pretty different than fruit, right? But again, if now I'm eating yogurt and I'm looking at a label and I see that it has 12 grams of added sugar, again, and I know I can only have 24, that's already half my day's intake from mm -hmm. something I thought to appear to be healthy. Mm -hmm. So again, I think it's really kind of taking that step back to say, again, and as I mentioned, knowing how much you're consuming sure. and becoming educated to be able to kind of start cutting back from those sources of added. Could you now have a plain yogurt where you cut up your own fruit that is natural sugar and add it in, right. and now you've created your own healthier snack, right? With, with the fiber, no, with the fruit as well. You got it. Right. I mean, you, you said the word fiber, which is like my favorite word when I talk and teach about diabetes. And right. I do, I, I mean, it is because people Absolutely. don't talk about it enough. Mm -hmm. we, we associate it with helping people go to the bathroom, but within blood sugar levels, it actually keeps them more steady and controlled. Mm -hmm. So instead of a quick spike, it's more kind of buffered and steady because you don't digest it. So fiber is really, truly important. And that's mm -hmm. why it goes back to half of the plate being from those non-starchy vegetables, right? Mm -hmm. um, and again, whole grains that have the fiber as well. So all of that combined to help again within blood sugar control, but also again, just leading overall healthier habits. And to enhance satiety. Yeah. If you eat something high fiber, you, it, it remains with you, you full, longer. Right, exactly. it, makes, it makes you feel less likely to think about what am I going to eat next. Exactly. You said about label reading, which I've become more of a label reader mm -hmm. every year, and I love it. Um, is keeping a food log or journal something that you recommend? So with food, you, it, it goes back to testing, same mm -hmm. concept of testing with purpose. It's the same with logging with purpose, right? Okay. If I need to kind of see a day's intake and now someone writes it down and they're keeping track of it, the actual part that I really want them to really look at is more measurements, okay. right? I was teaching a class yesterday and I mentioned a cup of rice, right, for mm -hmm. a gentleman and he looked at me and he laughed and he's like, that's not enough. 
I'm not right. <laughs> you're going to keep me hungry and starving, right? And that's right. not the point of it. It's really to try and now balance that plate with not just the rice, but also his vegetables and his protein, gotcha. which I think he was missing the point of now it's like a combined effect to fill mm-hmm. the plate, right? But looking at carbohydrates and having a limitation, it's not just the quantity, it's also the quality. So sure. the brown rice versus like a white rice for the mm-hmm. fiber, as you mentioned, mm-hmm. but then also combining it with what else is on the plate. So measurements are important when it comes to food. And then yes, maybe keeping track here and there. Again, I always connect it with the blood sugars in people with type two, you know, with diabetes, because again, it's that understanding of it versus just saying, I went high after a meal, why? Right? Right, right? You can go back now and keep track, not with just the blood sugar level, but also possibly what you've written down with food as a, as a indicator of what it might have been. Is there a way for um, me to take my fasting blood sugar level at home? Oh, sure. Well, there are blood glucose meters. I happen to bring one with me. Okay. Um, <laughs> she just happens to have yeah, it. I just happen to have happen one. To have one. Yes. They look like this. It comes with a little finger sticker that mm-hmm. has a tiny little needle in it, which does not hurt, by the way. And you change the needle each time. You and, don't see that coming at you, though. And you don't see it coming <laughs> at you, correct? It's spring-loaded, so you don't feel it. So you can and do that whenever you need to. You don't have to yeah, wait to you put go a little have strip somebody else in the do machine, it. And you test right. your blood sugar, and you know exactly what it is. But this is now being outdone oh. by um, continuous glucose sensing type devices that you can actually wear a little patch that um, some... Um, uh, a sensor. A, that a sensor is in the interstitial fluid and remains there for 14 days. And then you have this little reader or a phone, actually, right. that you swipe. You might have seen that on TV. I think That so. you swipe over the disc mm-hmm. and it tells you precisely now what is your blood sugar. Not only does it tell you that without the stick, mm-hmm. also every five minutes this reader is recording blood sugars. So in the course of a day, you see where have you fallen? Where are most of your blood sugars in the time of the day? And within the two weeks, that two week information is absolutely incredible for anybody to try to evaluate what that person really needs. Well, we've got a couple more questions from our audience, but before we get to those, I'd like to ask you, I know you're both not only experts, but you're educators. And a lot of your focus is on helping people in our community, not just our particular patients, learn about diabetes and preventing it. What kinds of uh, classes or programs does Baptist Health offer to people in the community? So the easiest way to find out with all of our programs is to go to our website, and that would be www.baptisthealth.com dot net backslash wellness and once okay. you get to that web page you can type in diabetes you could type in other topics as well today's <laughs> is diabetes and all of our programs will come up we do a general diabetes class with a nurse and a dietitian those run in english and in spanish and then the other one that we have upcoming as i mentioned to you as well is our diabetes prevention program right. so again we'll have the information on the website that you can see which classes may tailor to you specifically and mm-hmm. you can find out more information to contact contact us about. Very good. Well, I know uh, we have a couple questions from our audience. Here's one. Um, Does ethnicity play a role for high risk? Yes. There are some, there are some ethnic groups that do have a higher percentage of diabetes. Um, Primarily type, well, type one or type two. There are some, uh, the Pima Indians, for example, are very high risk for type two. African Americans, um, Hispanics, um, and as I said, Native Americans. So the, those groups do have a higher affinity toward the development of diabetes. Okay. And someone would like to know if you could explain the A1C test again and, and sure. how, what that is and how it works. Sure. So it, to make it simple, it's a simple blood test. Okay. Okay. And what that measures is an A1C component of hemoglobin, which almost is irrelevant, but the answer to that test is, on average, over the last three months, how well has your blood sugar been controlled? Okay. So our goal is that if you have diabetes and you're striving for control, you want your A1C to be less than 7% Mm -hmm. to avoid complications. Okay. Okay, even though 6.5 is normal. But, but you want it but we, under right, 7. But we say at least under 7, we can try mm-hmm. to predict that you could be free of complications. 
Okay. And I think just to add on, you know, where Lois was showing machine, that machine tests just one moment in time where she mentioned the other sensors, those are testing every five minutes. So now again, where I may have a blood sugar level and I don't know if it's going up or if I don't know if it's going down, those continuous glucose monitors are great to be able to make better decision making mm. and understanding what what is happening with the blood sugar level. So I think again, and then within regards to A1C, where it's an average of three months, I always like to tell the patients that it's not as if you can eat well the day before and then go into the doctor's office and think, you know, the, the doctor- You're gonna fool the test. Right, exactly. Right? It's a three month average. And I think, again, it gives great information to be right. over understanding what your overall average is versus again, just thinking of, you know, again, every morning, if you were just testing your fasting, right. your fasting is typically the highest level of the day, which mm -hmm. again, unfortunately, that would be discouraging if that's the only level that you're testing. For sure. So again, I think again, having the understanding of what your average is, and then again with testing, going back to switching the time of day that you test so that you can understand where you're at throughout the day versus just maybe that highest level, which is the fasting. Okay, I think we have time for one more viewer question. Um, can diabetes be reversed? Uh -huh. That's always a great question. Um, there is no cure for diabetes at this point in time. Okay. And a lot of people like to say, I reversed my diabetes. We like saying, you have placed your diabetes in remission. Okay. So you can be at a, in a state that your blood sugars can be perfectly normal with or without medication, but that doesn't mean that your diabetes went away. It didn't go away. Correct. All right. Well, thank you guys. We've um, come to almost the end of our time, so I'd like to wrap up with each of you leaving us with a final thought or a final suggestion for our viewers today. My, my final thought is, you know, this is not your grandmother's diabetes. So we have learned an enormous amount about the different types of diabetes and how to treat it. And it really pays to be updated on the latest instead of relying on what a friend or neighbor mm. or relative tells you that they remember, you know, from okay. whoever. And I think that's extremely important. Yeah, I think for me, it's always going back to food, right? And I think, as I mentioned, my encouragement is always for people to really, truly strive to improve and change one thing at a time so mm -hmm. that, you know, again, it's not as if you're changing everything all at once and you're really implementing and making the change. So reflection and seeing where you need to improve upon to feel better and obviously improve your health overall. And as Lois mentioned, you can always check in, as I said, our website, www.baptisthealth.net backslash wellness for all our upcoming programs, diabetes related and others. Terrific, that's a lot of really useful information and I know there's even more available on the website. Thank you both so much for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you for having us. For sure, and thank you guys for watching um, and for submitting the questions and making this interactive. Um, we'd like to remind you to please follow us on our social media channels. There are handles are on the screen for Facebook, Twitter, uh, LinkedIn, and Instagram. You'll be able to get the latest health news and keep up with the events that are happening here at Baptist Health. On behalf of all of us at Baptist Health South Florida, I'm Carol Higgins. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you again next time.